Right, so um, Dame Kathleen uh, Lonsdale, um, I'd just like to start really, I think, with a just brief introduction is how she actually became involved in X ray crystallography. So, as we mentioned before, she was also born in Ireland, um, in Newbridge, in County Kildare. She was actually the youngest of 10 children. Her parents separated and she then moved to Seven Kings in um, Essex. She was um, academically very able, won a scholarship to um, Ilford County High School. And then at the age of 16, she um, went to Bedford College for Women. Initially, she started uh, a degree course in mathematics, but then decided to change to physics. I think probably she liked the more the practical side. She ended up her time at Bedford College with first class honours degree. The examiner for the internal students was Professor Sir William Henry Bragg, who was currently um, Professor of Physics at um, University College London. He was particularly impressed, I think, with her performance in the examinations and offered her a position in his research team. So this was really the start of her career in X-ray crystallography. She was only at UCL for seven months uh, when Bragg accepted a position at the Davy Faraday Research Laboratory at the Royal Institution, and he took all his students with him. At the um, Davy Faraday, Bragg really invigorated the spirit of it by focusing particularly on, obviously, X-ray crystallography, and um, he created a very successful uh, research team. She joined, really, a lot of very other sort of young researchers who were very keen to find out about X-ray crystallography. So it was a very sort of vibrant um, a very vibrant team um, of young people. She became quite experienced in the use of the ionization spectrometer, which was um, an instrument uh, which was devised by Bragg for determining the structure of simple organic compounds. Um, Bragg's team at the RI focused um, on organic compounds as opposed to his son, Lawrence Bragg, who I think looked at inorganic, um, inorganic compounds. One of the things that she particularly liked was what you can term a sort of math mathematical uh, crystallography, in particular space groups. And they are um, mathematical description, really, of the symmetry um, elements in the crystal structure. She worked with William Asprey, who was also um, another of the workers at the um, Davy Faraday. I think she referred to him as, as Bill. And they worked on the relationships between X-ray diffraction patterns and space groups. And then together, they produced a very important paper looking at the 230 space groups um, by or the examination of these using X-rays. Now, this particular paper, I, I gather, was reprinted. It was very popular. It was very practical. And the idea really was that it was very suitable for those people starting on looking at the um, structure of organic compounds using X-rays. The picture shows really a group of some of these, some of the workers there. So um, they're on the, the roof of the RI. Um, you see William Asprey, and obviously next to him is Kathleen. Um, she was 24 at this age. And then there's Burgess, um, Robertson, and Gibbs. And then the two at the back, Holmes and um, Orelkin. Now, the other thing you might notice is that three of them are carrying uh, table tennis bats. Uh, what they used to do was to play table tennis in the basement. I think they used to take sandwiches and then play table tennis afterwards. So it was really quite a relaxed, although they worked hard, um, it was a very social, uh, very social environment. In 1927, uh, Kathleen's life changed. She married uh, Thomas Lo uh, Jackson Lonsdale, 
Now, he was a student she'd met at um, uh, UCL. They married in the August of 1927, and she then moved up to Leeds. He'd already got a job up there, and she was fortunate in getting a job as a research assistant in the Department of Physics. Uh, head of department was Richard Whittington, but she didn't actually work for him as such. She actually had to set up her own laboratory. So it was nothing like the Davy Faraday, which was all very busy, full of people. She was fortunate in getting some grants. She got a grant from her old university, um, Bedford College, and she also got a grant for um, equipment from the Royal Society. So she set up really sort of like a little mini, a mini laboratory on, on her own. She was quite fortunate in the fact that next to the physics department was the chemistry department. I think actually in the um, plan of the buildings, they were sort of like interconnected. The chemistry department was run by um, Professor Christopher Ingold. And um, he was just about starting, I think, on his studies in mechanistic organic chemistry. His students at the time were working on aromatic substitution reactions, and they had various products of these, in particular hexamethylbenzene and hexachlorobenzene, which either Ingold gave her personally or they were passed to her by the research students. She realized that these would be useful starting points for the examining the structure of benzene. Now, why would this be the case? There was a lot of confusion about the structure of benzene. Um, some um, chemists felt it was a planar structure, and others felt it was more like a sort of puckered or zigzag arrangement. The problem also with benzene being a liquid, it wasn't suitable for X-ray analysis, but both of these substances were solids, so they were actually ideal. I mean, she was 24, it was obviously quite a challenge for her, so she started off looking at um, hexamethylbenzene. Now, through, throughout her time in Leeds, she was in regular contact with Bragg. He, I think, gave her a lot of support and advice, and that's evidence really by looking at the letters that were written between them. She particularly requested that um, rotation photographs be taken of um, the hexamethylbenzene. She didn't have any photographic equipment, but these verified um, her results. And what is stated there is her conclusions, which um, were found, or which she wrote up in her paper. So it showed that the molecule existed in the crystal of a separate identity, the benzene carbon atoms are arranged in a ring formation, and the ring is hexagonal and planar. The paper you produced was printed in 1929, which obviously had all the details explaining how she had come to her conclusions. She then went on to have a look at hexachlorobenzene, trying first of all to use the method she'd used for hexamethyl, in addition to that, she tried using what's called a Fourier method, which is really a, a very complex mathematical model um, using or calculating electron densities. And I believe it stated she, she was the first person to use the Fourier method for um, the analysis of an organic compound. I mean, it is a method which is used by later crystallographers, which I'm sure um, will be spoken about later. She had to complete her practical work because she was expecting her first child. And Jane was born in October 1929. But what she did, she worked obviously on the calculations of the hexachlorobenzene. And this was the, as I said, the Fourier method is, well, appears to have a lot of, of, lot of uh, complex things to sort out. And she actually used just log tables to work these all out. Also, this was a problem. She got a young child and trying to work as well. But here, Bragg helped her. I think he uh, 
presented her case to the managers at the ORI, and she received a sum of money to, which would cover um, domestic help. Uh, her husband's job finished, though, in, in, the, in 1930, and the family moved back to London. She was then working at home for two years. She completed, um, obviously, the paper on hexachlorobenzene, um, and that was two months before the birth of her second daughter. So she obviously had two children in quite quick, quite quick succession. Unfortunately, the results for the hexachlorobenzene didn't really match exactly those that she'd obtained for the hexamethyl, but um, and, and, and I and say she did have some successes in certain areas, but she couldn't say altogether that the it showed that the benzene ring um, was was plain or, or not. But the paper she then uh, print was printed in 1931. Obviously, contains all the details of um, of her work and her calculations. Now she carried on, obviously not only looking after the two children. Um, but she started to work on tables of mathematical formulae. This was, I suppose, a, a follow-on from the work she'd actually done with Asprey in the, their first paper at the Royal Institution. She used um, old, um, used reference books and old X-ray um, tables to actually um, produce a, a really quite um, different type of book, which um, was published eventually by the RI a bit later in 1936. Um, because it's all handwritten, um, it had to be photographed, and then I think the photographs were published, so it was rather special. And we have, on the left hand side there, gives you some idea of the handwriting, it's all very meticulous, and the book just contains all of these tables, which there again were particularly useful for um, people starting um, to do structural analysis. Um, I think she was only actually paid a small amount, £25, as being the author, and uh, I think uh, 350 uh, copies were printed. I'm not quite sure how many were sold, and they were actually £75 each. So it was a very unusual book, um, but I think quite a contribution that she was actually making to crystallography as a whole. Having been at home for two years, she was really very keen to get back to the RI. But the problem here was one of childcare, which is a problem which uh, is very much uh, to, uh, present today as well. Here again, lucky, or she was fortunate, that Bragg presented her case to the managers and the secretary um, of the manager, Sir Robert Mond, very kindly gave her £200 there again for getting domestic help. She went back to the RI only actually, well, she started work again on what she'd been doing before on analysis of organic compounds, um, but left two years later to have her third child, Stephen. She only took actually seven months um, leave and returned and carried out then a lot of work on, on new areas. And I just listed some of these diffuse reflections thermal vibrations in crystals, diamonds, and divergent beam X-ray photography. I um, mean, those are, I think, just a few, but she certainly um, came back and did a lot more sort of different work to probably what she was doing before. She also became involved very much in what some people would perhaps term as her uh, contribution to crystallography or um, service to crystallography by, by becoming involved in the production of what are called the first edition of the international tables for the classification of crystal structures. So this was uh, published first in 1935 
I think there were two volumes of it, and it was very much a resource and reference book um, for crystallographers. So there again, underlying theme, very keen on doing, obviously, all the mathematical formulae and presenting um, information which was obviously useful for the crystallographic community. In 1942, Bragg died, so this was the, sadly the end of a 20-year working relationship. 1945, though, she was elected Fellow of the Royal Society, and she was one of two women, the first two women to be elected um, as members. She was elected, really, for the physical sciences, and the other lady, who was Marjorie Stevenson, was, uh, rep was elected for the biological. She now was becoming quite a sort of prominent um, scientist within, obviously, X-ray crystallography field. And she received an increasing number of invitations to take part in various um, conferences, both nationally and internationally. So this is just one of them. In fact, it's, I think it's one of the first ones. This is um, on thermal vibrations of atoms, and molecules, and crystals. So there she is in the middle. And she's with actually, I think, quite a prestigious um, selection here. So Schrodinger, who actually worked at um, the um, Institute, um, Max Born, she worked with Max Born quite a lot on diffuse spots. Um, Douglas Hyde, I gather, was the first president of, of Ireland. Um, Paul Evard, who was obviously a very eminent X ray crystallographer. And then the teacher or prime minister. Um, Eamon de Valera, who is also, I think, a very eminent mathematician. So this was really the sort of life that she started, um, and she really continued quite, to travel quite a bit to various conferences and that after this stage. The problem, I think, really, one of the problems she had, she was now 40, and she spent a lot of her career on grants and scholarships. And she was looking really for um, a permanent position. Here, and she was lucky, she was appointed as a reader in crystallography in the chemistry department at University College London. The head of department, that was Christopher Ingold, who'd obviously knew of her work. And I think he was very keen to have X-ray crystallography within his department. What was new probably for um, Kathleen was that she now had to be involved in teaching commitments. Um, I think she did set up a course, a practical course for um, um, undergraduates, it was, it was undergraduates or postgraduates, and she was also involved with Bernal in an intercollegiate MSc course. So this is with combining with um, when he was at Birkbeck College. Although um, I don't think, to be honest, teaching was, was exactly her forte, um, but it was obviously part, part of the job. Um, in 1949, she became a professor of chemistry. I think she would have perhaps preferred to have been a professor of crystallography, but that was actually not, uh, not what, what was on offer at a particular time. And she was the first woman um, to become a professor in any discipline at UCL. She established a very successful research school in X-ray crystallography, and she, that attracted um, both national and international students, and also a certain amount of women as well, or a portion of women. So it's very much like the um, research school that Bragg had set up, um, at the Davy Faraday. She continued with her own research interests, um, particularly diamonds, uh, though she worked particularly on, or she worked on both uh, natural and um, synthetic diamonds. And um, she w did uh, quite a lot of work on with this with um, one of her, one of her um, students that was um, Judith Greville Wells, who later became Judith Millage, who I think we're probably going to be um, hearing about later today. She also added some medical areas. 
Um, I think this was because she felt that she would like to have or become involved with problems in biological and medical areas. She worked on methonium compounds. I think those are used in, as analgesics and also endemic bladder stones. I think somebody came along with a selection of these and wanted them analyzed. And I think she managed to get some money from the Medical Research Council. The other area of her life or her working life, which increased was her commitment really to crystallography. She was involved, I think it was around about 1946, in the plan to establish an international union of crystallography. Um, this would obviously be part of the um, General International Council of Scientific Unions. It did involve, or they were, they, they were planning, shall we say, to revise completely the tables that had been produced in 1935 and also create um, a new journal. In 1948, she was actually appointed chairman of the editorial commission for the second edition of the tables. She decided that the, instead of two volumes, there now would be three volumes. So one on symmetry, one on mathematical tables, and the other on physical tables and chemical tables. And I think there was an editor for each of these, uh, together with a press editor. And um, as you can imagine, it involved an enormous amount of work. In fact, she was editor for 15 years, during which all these volumes were produced. So this really made a sort of a considerable contribution really to the development of crystallography. In addition to the tables, she became vice president um, of the union. And then sadly, um, Bernal, who was the president in 1966, was taken ill and she stepped up as president uh, for the seventh General Assembly, which was held in Moscow. And it was in fact the first um, woman president. I think I mentioned she was very interested in diamonds. And in 1967, um, a rare form of diamond uh, called, was called Lonsdalite. Um, it's a rare form found in meteorites, which was named in her honor. Her last attendance, really, on the eighth, uh, was at the 8th General Assembly of the Union, um, which was in New York in 1969. And 1971, sadly, she died of cancer. So her particular career had spanned nearly 50 years. She contributed not only sort of experimentally um, with our structure of benzene and all of the other areas that we've mentioned, but she made a terrific contribution to the service really of crystallography with all the tables she'd done and the, the tables she'd done, um, she'd written out herself. And the other thing is that she also managed to keep her career going. She had a very successful career, despite or despite or alongside, she was a marriage and um, three children. And how is she remembered? Well, two years ago, um, a blue plaque was um, erected and it was at the house in Seven Kings where she lived from 1911 to 1927. It states there, obviously, a crystallographer. She was also a peace campaigner. Um, and this was very uh, another side to um, Catherine's life. She was also, she campaigned for penal reform and she also campaigned for the position of women in science. Because I think she found that when she got really to the end of her career, there were very few women who were in similar positions. And she did quite a bit of work really trying to find out what that was in terms of um, background, education, all that sort of thing. She's also remembered in lots of other ways in, by um, Clark's buildings, etc. So University College was a building and a medal. Um, also at the Royal Institution, she's included in the, um, 
display along with all prominent scientists who worked there, such as Faraday and um, my, um, Humphrey Davy. Friends House, she was a Quaker, she was remembered there. And she's also remembered quite a lot in Ireland. I think like, like probably Bernal, um, they li like to consider her uh, as a, an Irish scientist. So buildings at various universities. Uh, she also has a scholarship and the Royal Academy of Ireland awards a Kathleen um, Lonsdale Chemistry Prize. So well, well rewarded really in both sides of the um, Irish Channel. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any of these clip things or not? No. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, got time for some questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to pick up on your point you mentioned towards the end that she campaigned for penal reform. Uh, I just wondered why you didn't mention that this was based on personal experience uh, and that she was actually imprisoned during World War II, just at the time that, as you mentioned, that her international recognition was taking off. Is, would you like to comment on that? Um, yes, that, that's right. I probably did, didn't mention it, but she was. It was um, as a result of her personal experience. Uh, because she spent a, a month in prison for not signing up for fire watching. It was against, obviously, her Quaker values. Yes, I mean, but it did. I suppose it was a, um, a turning point in her life, probably, as well, and set her on um, an interest in, in penal reform, yes. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment on... The Action as a peace campaign. I'm glad you mentioned that towards the end. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned uh, work as a peace campaigner. She was a founding, founding member, I think, of the Women's International yeah, League was. for Peace. Yeah, and um, my wife has memories of uh, discussions in the next room when she visited her granny, who was also involved. A discussion between the two old ladies to yeah. try to sort out the peace problems of the world. Yes. Yes. I mean, she, she spent a lot of time actually on, on her peace work as well. In fact, I didn't really know how she managed to put everything into her life, you know, but she, she did. Just a comment, if any, sorry, Elspeth Gellman, University of Oxford. Uh, just a comment that if anyone's going through Kendall, it's really, really worth going into the Quaker Museum there to see the tapestry, which yes, has... Yes, yes, yes. Um, I have been. Yes, on, and it's a scientist mm. one. Uh, I've got it here. It's got John Dalton, Kathleen Lonsdale, and Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington on it. And there's a uh, picture of an X-ray tube giving a diffraction pattern which on, in the tapestry. Mm. Yes, I, I would agree. It, it's worthwhile going. And they obviously got beautifully, beautifully tapestried on. And there's the benzene ring, isn't there, embroidered on it? Yes. Yes. My story about her time in prison was that she was told to register as a Roman Catholic because Roman Catholics had read a prayer oh, yes, books. A, yeah. They could moisten the cover mm. and pass off as a form of very cheap and effective lipstick. Yeah, that, that's right. They had the lipstick from the Red Bibles, that's right, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry there wasn't enough time to put all of this in, you know. <laughs> Okay. I think we'll okay. okay. Do you want this or the next one?